chance to pray out. I know you'll pray with thee. Call on to God on changing hand. Call on to his hand, Heavenly Father. He'll lead you home. Thank you, Lord. We're just passing through here. But we're on our way home. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Now we're turning to Minister Clark this morning.
song by the choir. Then Reverend Robinson will come back with prayer, and I'll come back with the scripture. You don't have to worry, and don't you be afraid. Joy comes in the morning, troubles they don't last always, remember 
church. Heavenly Father, Father, we come, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus the Christ. Father, we come humbly, Lord, before the throne of grace. We come thanking you, Lord, praising you, Lord, glorifying your name, Lord God, magnifying your name, Lord God. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, we pray. Father, look down upon us today, Lord God, with an eye of pity, Lord God. Father, forgive us for any manner of sin we committed, Father, and remember it no more, Lord God. Just let your holy and righteous will be done in our lives, Lord God. Father, we thank you today, Lord God, for this beautiful day, Lord, you've given us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for life, for help, for strength. Father, most of all, Lord God, we thank you for your son, Jesus, who hung, bled, and died for our sins, by whose stripes we were healed, and by whose blood we were redeemed, Lord God. We thank you. Father, we thank you for your precious Holy Spirit within us, Lord God. We thank you. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, we, Lord God, we pray, Lord God, 
for your manifested presence this day, Lord God. We thank you for it, Lord God. We thank you for your precious Holy Spirit within us, Lord God. We thank you. We thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Glory to your name, Lord God. Glory to your name. Manifest yourself today, Lord God. Manifest yourself. Father, God, every thought, God, every action through these services, Lord God. Father, bless everyone that hears or sees, Lord God. Father, help us all, Lord God, to receive what the Spirit is saying to the church, Lord God. Father, bless everyone in this building, anyone on the way, Lord God. Father, we pray special blessings, Lord God, over dear Pastor Bolton, Lord God. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, we pray. You just continue, Lord to strengthen him, Lord, to double and triple his anointing, Lord God. Fill him and refill him with your Holy Spirit, Lord God. God and direct him, Lord God, that he might guide and direct us, Lord God. Have your way, Lord Jesus. Have your way. Father, let someone be saved today, Lord God. Let someone be healed today, Lord God. Let someone be sanctified and filled with your spirit today, Lord God. And Father, let us all get a closer walk with thee, Lord God. Father, draw us nearer, Lord God. Take us out of self, Lord God. Just let your will be done, Lord God. Continue to grow us in grace and the knowledge of you, Lord God. Have your way, Lord Jesus. Have your way. And Father God, when we've completed our assignments on this side, Lord God, when we can do no more on this side, Lord God, Father, we're asking you for a home, Lord God, where we can praise your name forever, world without end, without the loss of one is our prayer. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Without the loss of one, Lord, is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. There's not a friend like the lonely Jesus I know.
uh, scripture this morning will be coming from the 23rd Psalm. If you can, would you please stand? I'll be reading the 23rd Psalm, verses 1 through 6. The Lord, he is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley in the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. But surely, but surely, but surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. These are God's words for God's people. Amen. Just keep on praying, the Lord is nigh, just keep on praying, he'll hear your cry, the Lord has promised, and his word is true, just keep on praying, he'll
Hallelujah. Just keep on praying. The Bible tells us that a man ought to always pray. Pray without ceasing. When everything is going as good as they could, pray. When the bottom falls out, pray. When you got a pocket full of money, pray. When you got a hole in your pocket, pray. When you're up, pray. When you're down, pray. We ought to always, always pray. Good morning, Mount Zion. We give God great glory. We thank him for his son, Jesus, our elder brother. We thank God for his Holy Spirit, who's our leader, our teacher, and our guide. We give God honor this morning for our deacons and trustees and all our officers and members and friends, those gathered here, those online with us. Today is a Good day to be alive. Amen. Amen. And on this day, we have a word from the Lord. Go with me to 1 Thessalonians, the epistle of Paul in 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 1 through 8. When you get there, if you're able, please stand in reverence to God's word. Amen. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 1 through 8. Let me read this way. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as we have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but to holiness. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. Amen? Yeah. I'm going to draw the subject this morning right there in that fourth verse where it says that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Right. We're going to reason together for a little while with the subject, possess your vessel. Possess your vessel. Let us pray. Oh, good and great heavenly Father, we thank you. We bless you. We glorify your holy and your righteous name. You are the great preacher. Fill me afresh now and use me to your greater glory. And although this is preaching time, this is your time with your people, Lord. Father, we are gathered together today. Visit them now, one by one. You know what they stand in need of, God. If there's a healing, thank you for being the healer. If there's one who needs to be saved, thank you for being the Savior. If there's one who needs food on their table, thank you for the being the one who provides all our needs, Lord God. Whatever it is, we thank you that you are our shepherd, and we shall not want. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Amen. Possess your vessel. 
possess your vessel. And I'm going to tell you up front, this is the first in a several week series. I'm going to preach this till God says stop. And we're going to be exploring our responsibility to take control over our bodies to honor God and be used by him in this life, even as we anticipate living with him for an eternity. And as I prepared for this series, I reflected on um, various conversations I had with my younger son, Christopher, over time, ever since he was a little boy. Um, when Christopher was born, Christopher was a big baby. And uh, he was a chunky toddler. And he was uh, uh, from, even in preschool we had him in, the academy we had him in, he was always bigger than most of the kids. And on through elementary school, he was one of the bigger kids, not just in his grade, but in the school. And, and he was even bigger than some of Alexander's friends, even though they were three and four years older than Christopher. You know, sometimes size work in your favor. And sometimes some other kids uh, who wish to be your size try to make it seem like you're different. And so they'll try to pick on you so they'll feel better about themselves. And that can make you feel self-conscious, particularly when you're younger. And so I didn't want Christopher to fall prey to that, and I loved Christopher's size. And now that he's taller than me, I'm, uh, 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 matter of fact, I, I'm, I'm kind of jealous <laughs> of Christopher's size. And I wanted him to love his size as well. And I would talk to him about embracing the body that God had given him. And I would tell him, Christopher, you must possess your vessel and not be ashamed of what God has given you and grow into that body and, 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 and learn to master it and become the person who God has called you to be. And I would tell him that God has blessed you with this vessel and ordained you to do certain work for the kingdom through that body. So learn to grow and, and control it and be who God called you to be. Do the things that he's ordained you to do in this body. And at some point along the way, he decided on his own to take control of his body. And he came and he said, Dad, I want to take karate. And so he began to take karate. And uh, a couple of months after he started taking karate, we noticed we would hear things early in the morning and late at night. And I said, Tommy, what is that? <laughs> then we'd go about a week and she said, Warren, what is that? And what we learned is that Christopher has taken his warm-up warm -up routine for karate and turned it into a workout routine at home. And so he was getting up early in the morning and working out, and then late at night he would work out. And over time, Christopher had transformed his body. And he had dropped 15 or 20 pounds and, and had become chiseled and, and just was looking good. And like I said, then he got all tall and, my God, he would come and stand next to me. And I had to hold my piece. I, I was asking, Lord, what happened? Because he'd gotten taller. He'd gotten lean. He changed his eating habits. He was consistent and focused in his workout and just reshaped his body, had taken charge over his body. But y'all know something? While we see his, the outward results, he had to make some changes on the inside to bring about those changes on the outside. Can I tell you that changes you make on the inside will show up on the outside, I remember uh, Bishop G. Patterson used to sing that song that something on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. If we want an outside change, we have to start with an inside change. On this Christian journey, we are called to be ambassadors for Christ. And the life we live, the examples we, we set must reflect the one we serve and not us. 
when people see us, they ought to see a reflection of Christ, not of the world. One struggle that, that the church faces today is that there are unsaved people who, who know their failings and, and, and many may be seeking deliverance, but they look at some saints and they see a reflection of themselves rather than a reflection of Christ. They see saints uh, who are doing some of the same thing they're doing and embracing the world and desiring the world just like them. In our text this morning, Paul tells us to do similarly to what Christopher did. He says, possess your vessels. Take control of your own bodies. And, you know, a key to owning our Christian journey is possessing our vessel and taking responsibility for what we do in these bodies. Paul says, take control of yourself and don't be overcome by sinful lust. The Bible tells us to walk in the spirit so that we do not give in uh, to the uh, lust of the flesh. These are our bodies. It's on us. And this battle is a daily battle. In uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 here, Paul tells the Gentile believers that, uh, he says, we taught you how you ought to walk to please God. And he says, you're doing a good job. And that word ought he uses it doesn't mean that you should consider or that you uh, should think about it. When he says, we taught you how you ought to walk, it means that it's necessary that you walk in a certain way, that you live a certain lifestyle, that you conduct yourself in a certain manner in a, so that you will be pleasing unto God. And to walk with God in a way that pleases him requires us to do right and to have the right attitude and the right spirit. That which we do in and of ourselves or through our own sinful nature does not please God. The spirit and the flesh are always in opposition one toward the other. The flesh does not want to do anything that pleases God. The flesh does not want to pray. The flesh does not want to praise. The flesh does not want to worship. The flesh wants you to feed it, wash it, take it to the mall, overeat, overindulge, be where you're not supposed to be. That's what the flesh wants, and it's always in opposition of the Lord. And what happens is, our inward desires, if we give unto the flesh, will bring out result, outward results that reflect your flesh. But if you give into the Spirit, it'll bring our results that reflect God. Colossians 2 and 6 tells us to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. So Paul says, you've been doing well, but... We want you to abound more and more. He said, we want you to grow in your Christian walk. Y'all know we don't ever stop growing. We don't ever stop growing. And the trouble we have sometimes is that we look horizontally at each other and compare ourselves to other folk. Well, I don't cuss as much as sister so-and-so. I don't drink as much as brother so-and-so, so I'm doing all right. No, we're supposed to look this way and compare ourselves to Christ. Until you become Jesus, you got work to do. So Paul says, uh, I want you to do more for God. He says, I want you to go above and beyond to please God. And y'all know we can't go far enough to please God. We can't overdo it in pleasing the God of John 3.16 who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. We can't do it, uh, go over, uh, overboard or uh, overdo it in pleasing the God of uh, Romans 5 and 8 who commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
We can't overdo it in pleasing the God of Ephesians 3 and 20 who can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. So Paul says it's necessary to go above and beyond. We like to say we can't beat God given and we ought not stop trying to give. Amen. In verse 2, Paul tells the Thessalonians what they had been taught came by the authority of Jesus Christ. He said, this is what Christ desires of you. This is what, how he desires for you to live. Verse 3 says, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Folks ask, what's the, I wonder what God's will for my life is. Even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. See, there are here two different thoughts in this one verse. There's a, a A clause and a B clause, as they call it. And that first thought uh, in this verse carries the overarching idea that, that Paul wants all of us to get. And he tells us, what the will is God of God is for us, and that's our sanctification. Some people try to blend this entire verse together and make it all about sexual sin, but that's not the, uh, the only uh, or the biggest takeaway here. Paul begins with a clear declaration that for this is the will of God, even your sanctification. And by sanctification, he isn't talking about a denomination. He's not talking about a, a religion. He's not talking about whether you wear makeup or whether you wear earrings or how long your, your, your dress is. He's not talking about any of that. He's talking about being holy, set apart for God's service. He's talking about being sanctified, removed from the things of the world and drawn unto the things and the character of God. It's about being in the world but not of the world. To be sanctified is to, to be yielded to the Holy Spirit and the thing that, that he has been sent to do in your life. See, the key thing the Holy Spirit is supposed to do is to sanctify you, to clean you from the inside out, to push out the old, that old evil nature that you had and, and, and bring a new birth in your life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So that old, mean, hateful nature ought to no longer dominate you. That old cussing spirit ought not no, any longer dominate you. That old selfish attitude ought not be dominant in your life. Those fleshly desires ought to be subdued by the sanctifying work of the Holy Ghost. And the result is you ought to be empowered to carry yourself as one who's dedicated and loyal unto God, one who obeys the commands of God, the one who, who yields to his will, and one who walks in the fruit of the Spirit, with love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. that ought to be a change when we're yielding and when we're sanctified. And, and, and after making it clear that believers are to be sanctified, Paul gives a, a real-life application of sanctification to the Thessalonians. The Thessalonians lived in a culture where, where there was uncontrolled sexual immorality. Lord have mercy. feel like we stay in Thessalonica, don't we? Lord have mercy. He says God's will is for your sanctification and that sanctification should lead you to abstain from sexual immorality. And by sexual immorality, he's talking about all kind of sexual activity outside of the God-sanctioned marriage, whether it's incest, fornication, pornography, adultery, you name it. Paul not only focused on sexual sin because it was a problem in that culture, but he did it because it's been a problem throughout human history, including today. People saved and unsaved struggle over sex and sexuality. Some ignore it and look the other way. But saints and sinners fall into sexual sin, but God calls us to live holy lives. 1 Peter 1.16 says, Because it is written, Be ye holy as I am holy. 
It did not say be perfect, but it did say be holy. It says belong, and to be holy is to belong to God. And if you belong to God and you call yourself his, you ought to act like you're his. We don't let people come in our house or we raised to act like they want to act. God's not going to let us act like we want to act. Everything we do, even in our sexual behavior, should glorify God. And you know, there's nothing dirty about sex in its proper context. God created it. God offered sex as a part of marriage and a, and a way for his uh, people to be fruitful and multiply. But we ought to uh, use sex to exercise lewd and illicit behaviors. We, we ought to look at others of the opposite sex as possible sexual partners or, or as a hooker. But we are to love and honor them as fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And this is a challenge throughout society. Yes, it's a challenge in the pulpit and it's a challenge in the pew. I know, Pastor, you're going to Maryland now. But in the church, in some churches, there's as much sexual immorality in the pulpit and the pew as there is in the local nightclub. And God's not pleased. So Paul says, I know you have grown in your Christian walk, but you must continue to grow, for it's God's will that you be sanctified. And one of the places where you can grow is in abstaining from sexual immorality. And that brings us to verse 4. But Paul raises another element of sanctification. And, and, and it's the centerpiece of, of, the, of the, the series that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in the lust and concupiscence. And that word concupiscence means uncontrolled or unchecked desire. Crazy appetites that we might have. He said, but, he said, but don't act like the Gentiles do who don't know God. He's don't, like, don't go around acting like folk who don't know God. And see, it, it confuses uh, the folks uh, who in the world when they see the people of God acting like them. And then they got the audacity to invite them to church. Lord have mercy. <laughs> Paul is saying you must know how to control yourself. And self-control is one of the elements of the fruit of the Spirit. And we know uh, all the excuses that people give. I couldn't help it, but Paul says, possess your vessel. Uh, 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 she was irresistible. He was irresistible. Paul said, possess your vessel. No one can eat just one. Paul said, man, please, possess your vessel. I just had to have it. Possess your vessel. Some folks flash back way back to Flipwood and said, the devil made me do it. And Paul said, possess your vessel. Paul uses sexual sin as an example because of its controlling nature. It takes over through lust and unchecked raw emotion and causes people to sin. It overtakes your body and it pollutes your mind and pollutes your spirit. And some might say, well, pastor, those days gone for me. God didn't bless me like he blessed Abraham and Sarah. Y'all get that on the way home. But see, this doesn't refer to just sexual sins. That's just an example. It refers to anything that causes similar corruption. Whatever your it is, whatever your thing is, I don't know a soul who, who if, if you in the flesh, I don't care how old you get, I don't care the changes that come in your life, I don't know anybody who just absolutely on their own grow out of sin. We just grow into sin that we can do at our older age. <laughs> Ephesians 5.18 tells us though, be not drunk with wine. Wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Spirit, we ought not let anything control us but the Spirit of God. 
and it's the spirit that will help us control or possess our bodies and keep us from sexual sin as well as any other immoral or spiritually corrupt act. And when you possess your vessel, you take control of your spiritual journey. Lack of control of your vessel leads to unholy detours and uh, leads to uh, invitations to unsavory characters who will join you on your journey. And then you all messed up out there doing things in the world and on your own and getting things done to you. And by the time you make it back, when the Lord leads you back, you come back with baggage, you come back cracked, you come back hurt, you come back with people God never intended you to encounter. You come back and, and then thinking that, oh, it's going to be easy to speak now. And the Lord said, oh, you chose that path. Right. I still have these challenges. I still got to grow you. I still have to take you through these things. Right. Lord have mercy. So Paul says, control yourself. And stop acting like you have no moral or spiritual standards, uh, as if you did not know God. He says, if you are truly God, devote yourself to holiness and stay away from all sexual sins and immorality. And then each of you control your own body. That's the other thing. Stop trying to look for warts and problems in other people's lives when you haven't stood in the mirror. And if you look close spiritually, I don't care how, it could be a brand new mirror with no streak in it. If you could look close spiritually, you'd see some cracks. But see other folk crack. Lord have mercy. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says it this way. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And it goes on to say, then be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And we have learned today that the will of God is that we be sanctified, yes. set apart for God's service. That he, so he's echoing 1 Thessalonians 4 and 3 there in Romans. It's God's will for you to present your body as a living sacrifice to him, a, a living sacrifice that he can use, a, a living sacrifice that he can operate through on the earth. Because God used bodies in order to bless his people. He used bodies in order to bring people to Christ. But remember Christ told his disciples said that you will do greater things. He said, I'm going to use you to do greater things. And in this day and in this dispensation, it's God's de 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 determination to use you and to use you and to use you to do greater things in the earth. God set the earth up in a way that he will not interfere with what's going on on the earth. It has to be done through men and women, boys and girls in the body. That's why he didn't just... Uh, uh, save Adam and Eve right there on the spot. Yeah. He had to send someone in the body. Yeah. He had to send Jesus yeah. in a body that we might be saved. Yeah. He had to suffer, bleed, bleed and die yeah. for us yeah. in the body. Yeah. There's some suffering. Yeah. There's some bleeding. Yeah. There's some pleading. Yeah. There's some praying. There's some interceding yeah. that we're supposed to be doing in the body yeah. for others. sit down in a minute. Remember I told y'all a story about I'd go on one day at lunch to the Bojangles. I was on, I was trying, Christopher, I was trying to possess my vessel back then. And I went and get to get a salad. And I asked for a um, grilled chicken salad. And I went through the drive through and they gave me a fried chicken salad. And I open it up, ooh, ooh, it smelled good, it looked good. I knew how Eve felt. <laughs> it looked good to the eyes. Lord have mercy, it looked good for food. Now I said, well, I'm going to eat it. But I got about halfway out of the drive, I said, no, I ordered 
the, 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 the grill, and I need the grill because I'm trying to be a little healthy, and I circled back around, and the line had gotten long, so I parked, and I, began, I went to walk in, and as I walked in, this young man who I assumed was homeless, he was just hanging around outside, and he, he, I spoke, and he spoke to me, and he said, sir, I'm hungry. I said, I said, well, what do you want? He said, just a piece of chicken. I said, well, you want two pieces of chicken? He said, no, just one. I said, no, I'm going to get you two pieces of chicken. I said, what else you want with it? He said, nothing else. I said, just you don't want anything to drink or a side or anything. And I convinced him he need a whole meal. And so I went in, and when I got to the uh, counter, I told him, I said, well, um, I'm here. I said, I need to get something changed out, and I need to put in a new order. And I need to change out this salad for a grilled salad rather than a fried salad. And I said, and I also need to order. And when I said I also need to order, they took the salad, and the woman down at the end said, sir, come on down. I said, well, I need to place an order. She said, I said, come on down. I said, I, but I got to place an order. She said, I know what you said. She said, come on down. And I got you. And um, I went on down. And when I got down there, I said, now I need an order. She said, what you need? And I told her I needed two pieces, and I need these sides, and I need this drink. And she went, and she brought my salad, and she gave me the two pieces and the side and the drink. I said, now, I didn't pay for it. She said, I told you. I got you. <laughs> and as I went back out, I gave the young man the food, and he took it, and he was so grateful, and I got in the car, and God said, all I needed, he said, I didn't need you to pay, I just needed your body. I needed to feed my son. All God needs is a body, and he needs our bodies, and he needs us to possess our vessels and bring our vessels out of some of the places and doing some of the things so we can then turn our attention to the things of the kingdom. And so Paul says in Thess uh, Thessalonians here that immorality comes from a lack of self-control and it hurts other people, particularly when it comes to sexual immorality that, that someone, that was somebody else's husband, that was somebody else's wife, that was too young at, at, at that time. Uh, and Paul also tells us that, that God wants us to avoid immorality and that he will punish it. That's right, God is going to punish some folks for some things they have done in their body, yeah. for some sexual sins and for some other immoral things that they have done. Yeah. And then verse 7 tells us in part why. It says, for God has not called us into uncleanness, and if you go into uncleanness, he, I don't know about y'all, but when I was little and I went in that yard and I got dirty and muddy, my mama called me out of uncleanness and tore my butt up. but he called us unto holiness. He has called us to live impure, uh, uh, impure lives. And so Paul finishes this up in verse 8 and says, Therefore, he who rejects the instruction does not reject man, but God who gives you his Holy Spirit. He says, If anyone refuses to live by these rules, they're not disobeying man. Pastor ain't upset. It ain't about no other leader. If they try to teach you, if they're not, they shouldn't be upset. It says you're not disobeying them. Uh, you're disobeying the teaching of God. Lord have mercy. Of the God who gives you his Holy Spirit to live in you, to grow you, to teach you. Paul knew that the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes could bring some of the most devout down if they lacked self-control because it had been happening since the garden. So Paul urges each believer to possess their vessel in sanctification to ensure that our outward behavior reflects a life of one who is continually becoming sanctified and becoming more like Christ. We must make sure our outward actions and our behavior do not bring dishonor to God. The Bible asks the questions, no, question, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost and that you are not your own? God's spirit lives in us to fulfill the hope and expectation of holiness and sanctification. The Holy Spirit gives us what we need to be overcome as he empowers us to possess our vessel. But pastor, how can I know how to possess my, uh, possess my vessel. 
you receive know-how, good godly guidance for good godly living from studying the word of God. The word includes know-how on Christian living and good conduct. The word includes know-how on facing temptation. The word includes know-how on drawing closer to God. 2 Timothy 2.15 tells us to study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And rightly dividing the word of truth is not reading, is not sitting up in Bible study, and not just simply being in Sunday school or in church in the morning. Rightly in dividing the word of truth is rightly living the word and, 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 and walking the word and, and, and using your body to the, to, to, the, to the glory of God as directed and taught through the scriptures. Believers get to uh, get know-how from the word of God guided by instruction and work it in the work of the Holy Spirit. We, and when I say we, I mean us and God control our sex lives. We control our thought life. We control our tongue. We control our lifestyle. And when we submit ourselves to God, his Holy Spirit enables us to use our bodies to his greater glory. Yes, temptation will come, but First John uh, 4 and 4 says, Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Yes, we'll face tough decisions, but Philippians 4.13 tells us that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. No matter the challenge, lean on the word of God and possess your vessel. Yeah. Lean on 1 Corinthians 15, 31, where, where Paul says, I die yeah. daily. Possess your vessel. Lean on 1 Corinthians 9, 27, that says, I discipline my body. I buzzed my body and bring it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself yeah. should be disqualified. Uh, possess your vessel. Lean on Ephesians 4 and 1. I implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Uh, possess your vessel and lean on 1 Peter 1.14. Like the Holy One who called you, be you holy, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Possess your vessel, beloved. Lean on the word of God. Lean on 1 Thessalonians 5 and 22. It says, avoid all appearances, avoid all appearances of evil. Avoid anything that even look like it might be wrong. See, it's got to, it's got to not only be right, it's got to look like. See, the saints can't go out there looking sneaky. The saints can't go out there looking like they're trying to hide. The saints can't, the saints can't go out there in the dark dipping and dodging. The saints got to walk out boldly and represent the God who died, the God who saved them, the God who shed his blood that their sins might be forgiven. Jesus walked to the cross with the cross on his, up the doctor's hill with the cross on his shoulder and the whole uh, uh, city saw him. They spat at him. They talked about him. They beat him. They slashed him. He, they did all manner of things to him, and he did not do it in the dark. He took his body to the cross to be beaten, to die, and he did it in the light of day. And we have to work the works that he's given us. We're to possess our vessels. We're to be operate under the control of the Holy Spirit. We're to walk in love, walk in forgiveness, show compassion. We're to do the work of the Savior who didn't mind the possessing his vessel and then in the end, see, possess your vessel ultimately means you're willing to give it up. You're willing to let it go for the work of Christ. He gave it up for us and we have to be willing to give it up for him. Well, we ought to give God a hand clap and pray. Next week, we're going to focus on the eyes. We're going to focus on the eyes as we explore possessing our vessel for God. There might be one today 
who doesn't know Christ. Today is a good day. It's the only day that we have. This is the only moment that we are assured of. If you don't know Christ, today is a good day to accept him as your Savior. If you're unsaved, pray this prayer with me. Lord, I'm a sinner. I've done all sorts of things in this body. But I heard that if I confess my sins, you are faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Forgive me now and save me. I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. Thank you for saving me. Fill me now afresh with your spirit. And use me for your greater glory. You prayed that prayer, you're saved. God, we just thank you, God, for being the awesome and mighty God that you are. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Fill us afresh even now, God. Use us, Lord. Use our hands. Use our eyes. Use our mouths. Use our feet that we might help grow the kingdom, that someone might see our good works and glorify the Father who's in heaven. Lord, bless these, your people. You know what they stand in need of. You know their every concern. Lift their burdens today, God. Strengthen their bodies. Provide, Lord, as they need provision. Bind us together in love and unity here in Mount Zion, that we might be a spiritual house built up, fortified to do your work in this community and beyond, God. We pray, Father, for the Hamden Kershaw community. We plead the blood of Jesus from county line to county line. That you know, Father, just bless our children. Let them know, Father, the depths of your love for them. We pray that they come to know you. Pray that they grow up, Lord, and become your children and call on your name. That their success in the school, that their success is in life. Bless the state. Yes, indeed, this nation and this world, Lord. Father, we need you. Without you, God, we would just tear each other apart. But thank you for the restraining power of your Holy Ghost. We love you, Lord. We bless you. We glorify you. Thank you now for these gifts. Thank you for the givers. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and the sweet communion of his Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide with us now, henceforth, and forevermore. And the people of God said amen, 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 and amen. Praise the Lord, my son. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We need to have a church meeting.